Hi, and welcome to MentorCore. If you're new here, we're a community focused on helping people in the security, risk, and compliance fields grow their careers and leadership skills through mentoring. You can find more information about MentorCore at mentorcore.biz. I'm Dan Ayala, along with Lisa Beth Lentini Walker. Now, on to this week's discussion. Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Dan Ayala, along with Lisa Beth Lentini Walker, and today we are joined by Mallory Narang, uh, who is a technical a technical program manager and manager of privacy technology at Amazon. Welcome, Mallory. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. We're glad to have you. Um, you know, first off, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and your and your background and where you come from and how you got to how you got to uh, where you are today. Yeah, I have kind of a fun journey to talk about, actually. So, uh, you know, my my career has not been a linear path, along with lots of other people. Um, and, you know, if, if I could say that there's one theme that kind of brings everything together, it's that I've always been that lawyer who knows technology. So I started out my career actually as a paralegal, even when I was putting myself through law school, I was working full time and uh, at a law firm. And uh, I was that younger person in the office who knew databases or who knew technology enough. I took a, you know, a really foundational, just like Microsoft suite, you know, class in college. And then that's why I got hired as a paralegal. And they're like, Hey, you know, computers, like type my timesheets for me, um, Click me for credit. <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, so that's, that's where I got my first exposure to like how the law uh, could interact with, with, technology. And um, the firm I was working for actually was uh, in a mass action suit with the US government, uh, the federal government, they had gone up to the Supreme Court and had a unanimous verdict, but because it was a mass action suit, we had to make sure that all the claimants actually kind of proved their damages um, individually. And so one of the things that I did in order to get more claimants uh, for this litigation was I helped develop a web scraper like back in 2008 or something like that um, to uh, identify claimants. And it helped us win $500 million for a very small law firm in Minneapolis um, that still operates today. So. Uh, that was, you know, kind of my first exposure to how powerful combining tech with the law could be. Um, it really spurred the rest of my career. And so I've always been that person that works, you know, really closely with lawyers or development teams kind of in the middle trying to work through really hard problems that can be solved um, with data or technology. Um, I, you know, went to law school, graduated, got an MBA, um, and then I started working as a lawyer for, you know, a startup right out of school. Um, I did some, uh, you know, recruiting for a little bit because I, I have an HR background. Um, and through that, I actually found, uh, I would say, my first big girl lawyer job uh, at a place called Ceridian. And it's, it's honestly a great place. It's, it makes human capital management technology. Um, I worked really closely with product management and development teams there to make sure that all the features that we built were compliant with law and uh, to help our customers keep updated with changes in employment law because they're super rapid. Um, that led me to privacy. Um, we started getting our platform ready for GDPR and we found out that we had to like re-engineer big parts of our the way that our databases worked to be compliant with that. Um, then AWS recruited me and I went and did something totally different. I worked in global trade and product compliance um, and helped AWS build a tool that helped uh, transfer different hardware between our data centers uh, to reduce procurement costs, but uh, we had to figure out a lot of compliance concerns with that. So I wrote a bunch of logic there and got really interested in the technical side of AWS. Um, then a project opened up called depersonalization. That's what I work on now. Um, I, for all of Amazon, AWS, um, and all of our subsidiary and portfolio companies like Whole Foods, Twitch, uh, some of the other brands you might or might not have heard of, um, I help uh, do a large scale deletion or anonymization campaign um, across 3,500 internal um, and external services and uh, protect the, the data of 1.5 billion Amazon candidates, employees, and contingent workers. Um, so essentially what we did is we took 
uh, a very legal policy that was about 17 pages long and uh, nobody knew even existed pretty much um, before the GDPR. And we uh, turned that into code that computers can actually, or, or services can actually read. Um, and so a developer doesn't have to know anything about the GDPR. They just connect to our API and they understand exactly what they need to delete. Uh, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, we make other privacy technology uh, that's leveraging uh, some of that same infrastructure that we built. So we're uh, automating things like data subject requests, um, which takes up a large amount of our time and, and legal spend. Um, so I'm kind of there trying to bring, you know, how can we, uh, trying to solve the question of going beyond, do we need to train people to this scope is so massive, we couldn't hire enough people to do this thing. So how do we achieve compliance without telling anybody anything, right? Um, so that's kind of the central challenge of my career. And sorry if that's really winding. Um, oh, it's awesome. kind of how I got to where I am today. <laughs> it's, it, a, it, it's a great it's totally path. Awesome. Um, yeah. And of course, it generates, you know, a thousand questions that I have <laughs> But we only have a you know a short amount of time today. I, sure. I, I I'll ask one and then Lisa Lisa Beth please yeah feel go free. ahead. Um, I d so there's two that come to mind, but the one I think most important is it is we're in this era where automated decision making, especially when it comes to privacy data, comes into play. How has been how has it been you know, by being a lawyer? by being an attorney and also working in this technology space and, and working on automation of some of this activity. Um, how has one ex expertise played off the other or, or forced you to think, I guess, differently or, or as you think sure. through automation, as you think through the law, as you think through um, the technology implementation of what's a really critical service? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I talk a lot to the people that like, you know, people internal to Amazon about this, or even like people like, you know, my family members who I'm trying to explain what I do to them. And they're like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so think about it this way. Uh, Facebook has billions of users, right? Uh, Amazon also has billions of people that use its services, right? Um, think about what it would take to, for example, police the content on Facebook um, or just, you know, review it, uh, what it would take for humans to do that type of activity. Billions of people making multiple, you know, posts a day or even Twitter, for example. Think about like what a human compliance for Twitter would even look like, right? It's, it's scale that we haven't seen before. Data isn't like physical products. It's very much at a large scale. So even if these companies wanted to, you know, make the spend and hire all those people, they couldn't do it fast enough. And can you think about getting all of those compliance team uh, members to consistently apply rules uh, about what no, is no, allowed and what is not allowed? <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of space that we operate in, right? We have so much data. And in some cases, humans really are needed for reviews. Um, but in some cases, the scale is so large that you need another mechanism, right? And so what, we, what I like to do when I get faced with a problem of, you know, should we use automated decision-making in that area? Scale is the first thing I think about, um, but also, you know, we think about, okay, lawyers don't even know it, but they operate off of so much internal logic. One of my, you know, jobs at Amazon is to write down that logic. Um, because sometimes, you know, uh, I'll go to a compliance team and they'll say, oh, this is a case by case basis. We have to do a, a, a manual review of everything. And when I sit with them and I actually work with them, they are using rules. They just don't even realize it, right? There's a heuristic that all of our brains use to make decisions. And really automation is about just making that explicit and turning it into a processing order. So that's really what I've built like my career on is, okay, I'm going to sit with you and help you write this logic. I'm going to show you that this can be just as good as what you're doing. And then when there really are edge cases, you get to focus on those ones that really matter instead of 
all of this administrative work that you had to do reviewing hundreds or thousands or even, you know, millions of cases to get to those three that you actually care about. Right. Um, so there is a way to do it smartly. You just have to like really break it down into the most, into the littlest pieces and really figure out your logic. Um, I never automate a process without trying it manually first because you learn so much from doing that. The best possible situation for automation, and if you're working you know, to get there in your company, best possible thing you can do is have a written down process. That is something to go off of and build off of. And then you can bring a technical team in and say, okay, what elements of this could we leverage computers to do, right? Such that there were more people like you that could help people get to that realization. That's a wonderful. Uh, it's it's, it's actually really like if you, it lends itself really well to like a methodical process of inquiry, right? Like, and it's kind of like you know, Lisa Beth, what you were talking about in your book, right? Like, there's there's kind of a method you can use to control any uh, any process or any you know any compliance problem. It's just a matter of breaking it down into like manageable pieces and logic. I, I love that. So, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about um, bringing technology mm -hmm. and connecting technology to law. So there are a couple of things in life that I have heard <laughs> lawyers say that they're afraid of. One of those things is math. <laughs> the other thing is tech. Um, so yeah, like I've heard a like lot a of that. Bit of both. <laughs> if only there were tech that could do math. <laughs> yeah, I know. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me how you're helping upskill some of the attorneys and people on your team when they don't like maybe all they have is they have some type of exposure to Microsoft Word or something mm -hmm. like that. How do you? Um, make it less scary. How do you um, yeah. upscale those people to be ready for the, the challenges ahead? So biggest thing is that, first of all, people don't, a lot of people don't even understand all the resources that are available to them to upskill, right? It, it can seem daunting at first. And especially when you're in meetings, you know, nobody wants to look stupid in a meeting and admit they don't know something, right? Um, however, that's when growth happens, or at least that's my, my uh, opinion. I've, as I've, you know, kind of matured in my career, I've understood it's okay to, you know, say that you don't know, but, at, you know, especially in places like Amazon, that's not going to cut it. Like we have a lot of lawyers who walk into the room and say, I'm not technical, and they throw their hands up. And it's just, you can tell there's a mental blockage there. The biggest thing it takes is an open mind and a willingness to learn, right? Um, there's a lot of uh, online content on places like Coursera. I take courses on Coursera all the time. I'm taking one right now um, in PM skills from Google, just because that's an area where I want to, you know, see how other companies are doing it. Um, you know, a lot of this training you can take on your phone. For AWS, for example, there's lots of different vendors and free content even on our website that will train you. you have, and it's, it's developed for people who have pretty much no exposure to it. Um, the whole tech industry right now knows that it has an upskilling program. I have recs on my team right now that have been open for over a year because we can't find anybody qualified enough to do it, right? And, you know, with the immigration problem getting bad with COVID, like it's even worse, right? So we are having to look to upskill people. Lawyers are great critical thinkers. And like I said before, they think in logical terms. So mainly when I'm looking to upskill, I'm just looking to make connections that they're familiar enough with to get the concepts. Um, we have a BI dashboard at Amazon called QuickSight. It's our version of Tableau, basically, or Power BI, if you've used that in the Microsoft suite. And people are really, you know, one of the things I do when I train people on it is I, I sit them in a room and I say, look, this is just like Excel. Have you ever used a pivot table? This is just like a spreadsheet. And I show them how it is. So I make these cons, I take these concepts that are familiar to them and I kind of move them into that new space. Um, the other thing that I do is, you know, introduce them to user guides. Like most products nowadays have user guides that you can look things up in. I'm not an expert in tech, I'm just a really good Googler, 
right? Yeah. Like I, you know, that's a skill. That's curious. a skill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have a, we have a leadership principle at Amazon and we take our leadership principles very seriously. Um, you know, that we quote them at meetings and they're very much a part of the way that we do our business. It's called learn and be curious. Right. And we expect that people are going to be curious about their work. If they don't know something, there's an internal wiki they can go to. Is there a user guide you can use? Um, is there, you know, a training available even on YouTube that you can watch? Or, um, you know, is there something on LinkedIn Learning or Coursera, um, things like that? So I think it just takes like an inquisitive nature and uh, the willingness to know that at first it's going to be painful, right? Like, <laughs> I, I've definitely stumbled myself, but again, like one of the reasons, the ways I got into tech at Amazon is that my team needed a BI dashboard to report metrics to our leadership. And I was just, I raised my hand and I was like, all right, I self-taught myself it, in maybe a week. It, it wasn't hard. Yeah. So um, as you think about the methodology, one of the things that you and I talked about well before today was how to Kanban your life outside yeah. of just your work. Talk to me a little bit more about why you decided that was a good plan. <laughs> My husband and is start actually. With what, start with just a brief on what Kanban is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, to do, doing, done. It, it's basically, you know, vertical swim lanes. Think about it as columns in a spreadsheet. And you have, you know, this is what I'm working on now. This is what I, you know, or this is what I need to do. This is what I'm working on now. And this is uh, complete, right? Um, simple things, you know, it really just started off with post-it notes where people would like make a board on the wall, take a post-it note and move it from one place to another, right? Um, you know, we, I do this with my team at work, uh, you know, even though we're a, a team that's not developing products, we use a Kanban board as part of our scrum uh, process. And, you know, I was, I was doing that at work and my team, uh, you know, in the past six months has uh, had a productivity gain of 79%, even though we lost two headcount. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, and that's measured by task output. And so, you know, Honestly, it was, it was a lot about like, it, you know, if we, you apply it to your book, Lisa Beth, like communicating is so powerful. That's the only reason we're doing it. It's not the tool that's making us more productive. It's the fact that we're talking, <laughs> right? And so I looked at that and I was like, hmm, you know, I could use that for my life. My husband's an engineer. He thinks in that way. He was already using one for himself. And to be totally honest with you, like, we were using one because we kept having an internal debate. I do more of my chores on the weekends, you know, like I block them all into like one time. And then my husband tends to do things like spread out over the week where he'll like make us meals. And we were trying to go, hmm, who does more chores? Like, is this imbalanced or not? You know? And so we were able to like, you know, put together a board like that at our house and say, okay, what do we need to get done for the week? How are we going to get there? How, what pieces do you need to do? And what do I need to do to make this house run efficiently? And why don't we settle our argument about who does more with, with actual data, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. So like, <laughs> well, I mean, when you get a, when you do stuff like that at work all the time and it's your job, it just ends up bleeding into your life. <laughs> This episode I think I need, may never I think make I need it to air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope it didn't like uh, you know, cause any marital problems here, but um you know, it's just one thing that's worked for us. Honestly, uh, you know, lives can get busy. There's lots going on. It's good to have one place where you can go and you can go, okay, this is an inventory of what's going on right now. And I just need to figure out how all the pieces work together. To me, I'm just very visual and it works. The one challenge that I know people run into when dealing with Kanban or with any any kind of um, idea dumping uh, mm -hmm. or idea, idea repository and then filtering is a sense of overwhelm that comes yeah. from looking at all of the things that need to be done. Fair. Um, how do you go through and, well, I guess, how do you keep that from 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 keeping you from moving uh and anything yeah. that people can do is they start to think about this and get that massive list and then go oh <laughs> and don't know yeah, where yeah one of the things i love about like legal and compliance people 
is their thorough their ability to be thorough and really thoughtful but sometimes that can stop them from acting because they're like oh i need everything to be on the board i need everything to be perfect before i start doing something mm -hmm. and um really that's not the case like the great thing about scrum and kanban is that they're meant to be like tools that help you get somewhere iteratively and uh kind of tools that you can use and and iterate on over time right it's um so you don't need to have, like some people they feel really good about filling out a backlog right and that can be another part of your kanban board where you just have an area off to the side that says i know i need to do this sometime in the future it's not urgent i'm gonna put it here but like so i remember it but I know it's not urgent, right? The someday maybe um, pile. Yeah. Someday maybe. Yeah, it's a great way to describe it. Yeah. Um, some people get really obsessed with filling that out. Some people are like, you know what? I just want to get started. It works for everybody. It just, you know, it's flexible enough to do that. Like if you look at the Scrum methodology, it's talking about continuous improvement, right? And the best thing is to just get started and go off of your gut and then refine from there. So when I teach this to my teams, even at work, I'm like, I don't introduce like, you know, more complicated co concepts like story points, which is a way of weighting how, how much your tasks take relative to other tasks. Um, I don't even have them start out with that. I just have them started out, start out with getting used to working on a board, right? Mm -hmm. um, once you do that, you can introduce one more thing. Right. And then you can see, like, you know, track your velocity over time. Right. You can say you can take your, you know, I usually do one week sprints for like business teams because things change too much week to week to really plan um, that far ahead. So what I do is I say, OK, one week, look at what your task output is, then try a little experiment experiment. See if that makes your task velocity go up or down. Then you know, it's kind of like a little science experiment, the experiment, right? Then you know what works and doesn't work. You just learn it over time and that's how you get more productive is you do a bunch of little experiments. Um, I will say one other thing at Amazon, we talk about the concept of two one-way and two-way doors, right? Um, one-way doors are a door that you walk through and you can't open again. And two-way doors are a door you can walk through and walk right back through if it doesn't work. Most decisions we're taught are two-way doors, right? So you shouldn't spend a lot of time overthinking those types of decisions um, or uh, actions because you can always just do something else. Um, with the one-way doors, you have to think a little bit more. And I think that helps, right? Like getting started with something, it's a two-way door. If, you, if it doesn't work for you, just stop, do something else, right? I love all of that. Um, so one of the things that um, we always ask is, um, what's the best advice that you have ever gotten from a mentor? And I think it's an important one, but sometimes yeah. it's hard to answer. So what do you think? Yeah, actually, uh, <laughs> I, I got this from a combination of mentors, but and I tell the people that I mentor uh, that I mentor all the time. Uh, it's related to compliance. It's really like compliance isn't, uh, you know, nobody's going to care about more about compliance than the people who do it, right? That's just a fact. And so, um, you know, if, if somebody doesn't understand what you're trying to tell them about the law, like that's your problem. That's your burden to help that person get to that place. It's not their burden to understand something that it's not their job that they weren't hired to do, right? Um, and I, I often find that that leads me to be more customer focused uh, when it comes to serving like people that the people that I serve at Amazon to say, all right, am I unfairly putting a burden on somebody that really should be on me um, to make easier for them? Uh, I'm reading a book right now called Nudge. Um, and it's all about making choices easier for people. It's behavioral economics. And I think that's really, really powerful. When you make something easy for somebody, they will always, almost always do it. So how can you, you know, I just challenge people, like, how can you make things easier? That's great that's fantastic. advice. Yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the time that we have uh, for this week. But uh, thank you so much for being here, Mallory. Really appreciate it. Just wonderful stuff. Thanks. You two are electric. It was so fun. I love it. Um, I, I can't wait to become a subscriber of your podcast. 
Thanks so much. And thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, we'll see you again on the next Mentor Club.